This week on the A Push Show, we're looking at Chapter 19 from Crisis to Empire. We'll look at the politics of equilibrium. Did the United States manage to maintain equilibrium, or were they all off balance and messed up? We'll look at the agrarian revolt. Man, you'd think agrarian people would be more pastoral and docile. I wonder what made them so revolting. We'll also look at the crisis of the 1890s. If it's anything like the crisis of the 1990s, I bet there was a lot of jinko jeans involved. We'll look at a cross of gold. I've seen many crosses of gold around people's necks. I wonder what was so special about this one. We'll also look at stirrings of imperialism. I wonder if it's better than shaking of imperialism. You know what they say, it's better to be shaken, not stirred. Right, Taft? We'll also look at a war with Spain. Was it better or worse than rain in Spain? Considering it's a war, it was probably worse. Lastly, we'll look at the Republic as Empire. Gee, we fought this war to get away from an empire, and now we become an empire? Wow, what a bunch of hypocrites. I wonder if it was worth it. All this and more this week on The A Push Show. Chapter 19 starts with a discussion on the balance between political parties in the late 19th century, which is fitting because Taft and I are all about balance. Isn't that right, Taft? The political balance between Democrats and Republicans was remarkably stable at the time as there were about 30 states that would consistently vote Democrat or Republican and five other states that would go back and forth. Nowadays, we would call those states swing states because they can swing the balance of power in an election. And voter turnout back then was also quite high among eligible voters, as people were generally very intense about politics. Elections would see roughly 78% of eligible voters participate in elections, even ones not involving a president. This is a stark contrast to today, where only 50% of the eligible voters participate. What's also a stark contrast to today is that in order to be an eligible American voter back in the late 19th century, you had to be a guy, and because elections were almost always run by racists, exercising racist laws in a racist country, you had to be white too. Party affiliation, much like today, was usually correlative to one's ethnicity, culture, and location. But it's important to remember that the norms we associate with the Democrats and Republicans today were not true back then. The Democrats would usually find support among whites in the South, as well as recently arrived immigrants, poorer workers, and Catholics. Republicans would find a larger degree of support in the North as well as middle-class workers and Protestants. It's also worth noting that much like today, neither party did a whole lot for most people's economic interests at that time. But to be fair, the national government didn't have nearly as many responsibilities for the American people back then compared to now. For the most part, all the federal government had to do was deliver the mail, maintain the military, conduct foreign policy, and run federal courts. Sure, the government might subsidize some railroads or destroy the hopes and dreams of striking laborers here and there, but that was about it. They also took on the role of providing pensions as they provided payments to Civil War veterans who fought for the Union Army. Some hoped that the pension system would become permanent and universal, but because of rampant corruption, people didn't really like the idea of a universal pension system, so that idea fell flat. And since the federal government didn't do a whole lot, neither did the president. The most important job the president had back then was appointing people to work in the federal government, particularly the post office. Usually presidents had a great deal of freedom to appoint whomever they wanted, which naturally lends itself to patronage, politics, and corruption. But the Republican presidents of the late 19th century struggled to do what they wanted as their party became more and more divided. On one side, you had stalwarts, who, as their name suggests, Jess favored traditional machine politics while the half-breeds favored reform. Taft, you're a half-breed. 
The presidency of Rutherford B. Hayes started in controversy, promised to be short, and suffered from near constant frustration. You may remember that Hayes was quote unquote elected after the dubious compromise of 1876. He promised to only serve one term, spent much of his presidency trying to satisfy both stalwarts and half breeds, ended up satisfying neither, and left many of his visitors disappointed as his wife, a staunch advocate for temperance, forbade the consumption of alcohol in the White House. You know, you don't need to have alcohol to have a good time, Taft. Maybe. Despite the unfortunate presidency of Hayes, Republicans managed to get half-breed Republican James A. Garfield elected in 1880. Garfield began the process of reforming the process of federal appointments, which upset many stalwarts, including a deranged and disgruntled stalwart gunman who, after being denied a job in the federal government, shot Garfield twice at a train station. Garfield would die from his wounds three months later. And who do you think replaced Garfield Taft? I think you're thinking of the cheeky Jim Davis cartoon. Not the American president. Oh, as you can see, once again, Taft is going by the book. Garfield would be replaced by his vice president, Chester A. Arthur. Arthur was a stalwart, but despite his political background, upheld most of Garfield's appointees and even managed to help pass the Pendleton Act, which required more federal positions to go through a more extensive qualification process. The election of 1884 was one of many American elections in which both candidates had very little discernible difference in their vision for the future of the United States of America. But that didn't stop either campaign from getting incredibly unsavory and personal. The Republicans ran with James G. Blaine of Maine, probably because his name rhymed with his state, but also because he was a powerful leader in the party. The Democrats ran with reformer Grover Cleveland, who would also attract reform-minded Republicans who were insultingly referred to as mugwumps. Oof, the M-word. The race was close, but Cleveland won thanks to a last-minute religious controversy in which Blaine was not quick enough to condemn an anti-Catholic statement made by prominent minister Dr. Samuel Burchard. The Catholic vote would tip the scales in Cleveland's favor. Cleveland would be true to his reputation as a reformer and would seek to eliminate much of the graft that existed in the federal government, but he would fail to reduce the tariffs at the time, which were seen by him as instruments of corruption. In the election of 1888, tariffs would be the key issue as Cleveland would lose to challenger Benjamin Harrison, the grandson of former month-long president William Henry Harrison. The Harrison presidency was marked mostly by Benjamin Harrison not really doing a whole lot, but would change as new public issues would surface. First, there was the issue of trusts. The public greatly worried about various monopolies that popped up because of the exploitation of trust laws. In order to keep the public happy, Congress would pass the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890, which aimed to limit the formation and powers of trusts. In reality, the act was severely weakened in its power power to limit trusts and would usually be used against labor, the people who advocated for the legislation in the first place. The Republicans then tried to focus on the issue that won them the presidency, tariffs. They would pass the McKinley Tariff in 1890, which dramatically increased tariffs. But this proved to be a political disaster as Republicans got absolutely destroyed in the congressional elections of 1890. Many people saw tariffs as akin to monopolies and that they further benefited the rich at the expense of everyone else. The last issue the book mentions was the issue of railroad reform. Farmers were upset by the many shady practices taken by railroad companies. Railroad companies would often raise prices without notice or sometimes even after the fact. To respond to public pressure, the federal government passed the Interstate Commerce Act, which sought to maintain the constitutional provision that it was the federal government's job to regulate interstate commerce. But much like the Sherman Antitrust Act, very little was actually done to enforce the Interstate Commerce Act, and most courts enforced it sporadically at best. But no group quite understood the failures of the American government and the American economy quite like farmers in the 1880s. They experienced all sorts of economic disasters, which would then manifest itself into a reform movement for agriculture known as populism. 
First of all, you had the Grangers who stood as an affront to the popular myth that farmers are sturdy, resilient individuals who only need their hands and land to succeed. In reality, farmers need a lot of help from others, and the Grangers would seek to provide this. The movement started when an agricultural department official named Oliver H. Kelly tried to do something about the isolated and drab life of the American farmer. He would organize the Grange, which was basically like a union for farmers and agricultural workers. In the 1870s, the Grangers would proliferate up-to-date farming methods, build a sense of community, set up their own stores, warehouses, mills, creameries, and insurance companies, as well as their own marketing cooperatives, all in order to cut out middlemen who often took more than their fair share in order to get farm goods out to market. The Grangers would also set up their own political agendas, they supported farm-friendly candidates in the Republican and Democratic parties, as well as endorsing a few candidates in small parties like the Anti-Monopoly Party or the Reform Party. The movement saw huge success in membership, and at their height, they boasted nearly 800,000 members and even managed to help pass a few laws to restrict railroad rates and practices. But as we saw earlier, these laws were rarely enforced, and many Granger leaders were too politically inexperienced to to make them effective. Also, agricultural prosperity in the late 1870s caused many to lose sight of the importance of a group like the Grangers, and the movement dwindled significantly by 1880. But though the Grangers faltered, other farmers' alliances endured. A southern alliance of farmers would emerge as well as a northwestern alliance, which consisted of Midwest and Plain states. These groups would organize themselves in much the same way as the Grangers, in which they would construct their own economic institutions, which were designed to help and cooperate with farmers rather than exploit them. They would also get involved in politics as assorted alliance lecturers would travel across the country speaking passionately on behalf of the farmer and against the collection of economic and political power in the hands of an unelected few. Many of these leaders would also be women like Mary Lease who gave fiery speeches urging farmers to raise less corn and more hell. It's important to note that women had been able to vote in most of these alliances since their inception and they would also advocate for issues that were specific to both rural women and urban women at the time like extending voting rights and also maintaining a more sober society. But the loose merger between the Southern and Northwestern Alliance at Ocala, Florida would produce the Ocala Demands, which was essentially a party platform. A new party would become official after a meeting in Omaha, Nebraska in 1892. It would come to be called the People's Party, which was also commonly known as the Populists. A true third party, the Populists would have growing success in the 1890s as they were able to elect three governors, five senators, and ten congressmen. James B. Weaver, the populist presidential candidate in the election of 1892, was even able to win 22 electoral votes. The populists tried to build a broad working-class constituency, but failed to do so. Most of the people who supported the populists were farmers, whose goals often conflicted with the goals of organized labor. Whether populist farmers were white, black, owned their land, were tenant farmers, or sharecroppers, they all were struggling to survive in an era where farming was becoming increasingly mechanized and commercialized. Populists found a great deal of support in mining states like Colorado, Idaho, Nevada, and other states of the far west thanks to their endorsement of free silver. This was the idea that money should be backed by silver and gold in order to increase the money supply and thus increase the availability of credit for people who struggled to grow their agricultural businesses. Southern populists naturally struggled with incorporating African Americans into the movement, but they were desperate for membership, so they allowed the incorporation of colored alliances in order to increase numbers. However, this was done under the understanding that whites would remain in charge of the movement, but once opposing politicians accused the populace of undermining white supremacy, the white Southern leaders gave up on the whole integrated political movement thing. The populist platform was to increase the power of the American farmer. To do this, they tried to set up a network of warehouses to store crops that could be used as collateral for farmers to receive government credit. 
They also wanted to end absentee land ownership, establish a gold and silver backed currency, government owned railroads, telephones and telegraphs, a graduated income tax and localized banking. The populist party was also prone to rhetoric that was racist, anti-Semitic, anti-urban, anti-intellectual and anti-Eastern as many farmers sympathized with those bigoted ideas at the time. But though the populists were certainly not free from their own faults and prejudices, they did raise valid concerns regarding America's increasing embrace of industrial capitalism despite the damages it caused many people. Which brings us to the crisis of the 1890s as more and more Americans would echo the concerns of the populace as the various crises facing the economy made Americans worry that the country was on the brink of collapse. Now, I'll admit, I am not the world's greatest economist in the world by any measure. <coughs> Quiet beast. But I'll try to explain this as clearly as I can. And like most depressions, it really started with the old one-two punch combo of reckless spending and an overestimation of the growth potential of the country, as well as widespread fear and panic that ensued after a crisis in confidence. The panic of 1893 started when the Philadelphia and Reading railroads failed to pay back loans and had to declare bankruptcy. This would trigger a collapse of the stock market, which means that everybody is trying to sell stock because they're worried the stock will soon be worth less. With stock prices falling, people's fortunes dwindled, no one wanted to spend money, no one wanted to loan money, banks that made loans were unable to be repaid, and businesses that depended on immediate growth failed. Times were tough, but it wasn't altogether unpredictable. Many banks, businesses, and railroads tried to expand too fast too soon, and the demand for such expansion was simply not there. Most Americans at the time were still farmers, and most didn't have the money to buy what people were selling. The Depression was the worst the nation had ever seen up to that point, as more than 8,000 businesses, 156 railroads, and 400 banks failed. The effects would last into the following century. Social unrest ensued as many worried about the instability of the American economy. A businessman and populist from Ohio, Jacob Coxey, advocated for public works projects and inflating American currency to ease the damage of the Depression. He would organize a march on Washington in which 500 protesters of Coxey's army would descend on the Capitol, but armed guards prevented them from entering the Capitol. And no angry mob ever descended on the Capitol again. Not! <laughs> Americans worried that after Coxey's army, the violence in the Pullman and Homestead strikes, and the economic depression, that America was headed for collapse. One of the issues that swirled around the Panic of 93 was the issue of using silver as currency. Now, as I've mentioned before, the American dollar today is valuable only because nearly everyone in the world agrees it is. It is backed by our collective confidence in the American government to honor its value. Back then, people didn't like that idea and wanted their money to reflect a certain amount of gold and silver. In 1873, it became apparent that the official ratio of the value of silver to gold was not stable, so the government discontinued using silver as a way to back up currency. This would be called the crime of 73, and many saw this as a crooked bargain between wealthy bankers and the government to keep wealth in the hands of the few at the expense of the many. The issue of free silver became a symbolic importance to the currency question as silver was seen as the cure to all of the economic issues facing the nation. Supporters would contend that it would expand opportunity and prosperity to more people. Opponents would argue that it would lead to further instability and worse economic depressions in the future. Which brings us to the election of 1896, which centered around this issue of currency, which really centered around the issue of economic crisis and depression at the time. Generally speaking, a party in charge during an economic crisis almost never remains in power. Republicans were banking on this as they would nominate William McKinley as their their candidate for the election of 1896. The Republicans took the stance of opposing free silver, which caused many delegates from western and plain states to leave the party. The Democrats were torn. In their convention of 1896, many conservative Democrats argued with southern and western delegates who wanted to incorporate aspects of the People's Party in order to take votes away from the Democrats. 
the party seemed that it would refuse populist demands until old William Jennings Bryan gave his cross of gold speech. Bryan, a young and highly skilled orator, spoke and compared the refusal to adopt free silver to essentially crucifying the working class on a cross of gold. The speech had immediate impact and caused Bryan to become the Democratic nominee at the young age of 36, still the youngest man ever to be nominated by a major party. The populists were worried because now a major party had adopted one of their major platform issues. They were faced with a choice, press on and probably gain nothing because they were trying to accomplish what another party was trying to accomplish, or fuse with the Democrats and endorse their candidate. They chose the latter. Many bankers and businessmen were terrified of the prospect of a Bryan victory and clamored to the assistance of McKinley. McKinley would spend nearly $7 million on his campaign compared to Bryan's $300,000. But Bryan would also somewhat revolutionize campaigning as he would break the tradition of presidential candidates staying out of campaigning. He would travel to nearly every corner of the country campaigning on his own behalf. However, this alienated a lot of Americans at the time who saw such campaigning as beneath the dignity of the office of the president. McKinley and the Republicans would win by 271 electoral votes to Bryan's 176 while also winning 51.1% of the popular vote. This would prove to be the end of the People's Party, who gambled everything on the fusion with the Democratic Party. With the loss, the People's Party would begin to dissolve, and the American farmer has never united under the flag of reform since. The McKinley administration was able to ward off impending economic doom for the United States as the economy recovered and labor unrest also remained calm for the moment. In 1900, after failed attempts to get powerful European nations to agree to accepting silver-backed currency, Congress would pass the Currency Act, which established a gold-backed currency. Conservative visions for American currency would win the day as Congress declared all money had to be represented by a fixed amount of gold. But many worried that the explosive growth of industrial economies would far outpace the availability of gold and thus not enough money would be available to sustain that growth. In a stroke of fortune, literally, the world produced two and a half times as much gold by the end of the 1890s as gold producing technology improved as well as new gold mines were discovered in Alaska, South Africa, and Australia. Worries of the failure of gold-backed currency would not be realized, but they weren't totally off. Which brings us to a discussion of imperialism. Now, imperialism in the United States began long before this period with the whole idea of manifest destiny. But manifest destiny kind of got put on hold in the 1850s as the United States was a little preoccupied with constructing, conducting, and recovering from this little thing called the Civil War. And even after that, the United States was a little more preoccupied with how to civilize and settle the areas that it had forcefully taken in the West from Native Americans and Latinos. But Manifest Destiny would re-emerge in the 1890s as Americans shifted their attention to foreign lands abroad. With nearly a century of subjugating Native Americans and Latinos in the West, white Americans normalized the notion of colonization. Many also worried about what would happen without a frontier to conquer. At this time, European powers were ruthlessly conquering as many pieces of the globe as they could. The United States had a serious case of FOMO as they worried that there would not be any lands left to conquer or any more brown people to exploit. Trade was also becoming more and more vital to the American economy as industrialism and oceanic travel dramatically improved. Foreign trade would double between 1870 and 1900, and many Americans felt that colonization was the next logical step to gain a greater share of the global trade market. Many of the country's leading academics would endorse a social Darwinist justification for imperialism. They would contend that English-speaking nations were the most superior on earth and therefore had a duty to spread their culture across the globe with the expectation that everyone would be like them. Alfred Thayer Mahan would contend that in order for the United States to become a great civilization, they must become a sea power that focuses on maintaining rich trade networks under the protection of a strong navy. Basically, the United States wanted to become what England had become in the 19th century, the wealthiest country on earth thanks to extensive trade networks, organization, and a top-class navy.
thanks in large part to Republican Secretary of State James Blaine of Maine, the United States would seek to achieve hemispheric hegemony. And in case you don't know what hegemony means, it's when one country tries to control a much larger part of the world. To do this, Blaine helped establish a Pan-American Congress, which was a very weak organization of various nation states in North, Central, and South America that functioned basically as a way to regularly meet and share information. However, the United States would flex its growing power as well as its commitment to the Monroe Doctrine during a dispute between Great Britain and Venezuela in 1895. The United States threatened to go to war with Great Britain if they didn't agree to go to arbitration with Venezuela over a conflict between the two nations. Great Britain then backed off. The United States would begin to experiment with imperialist notions in the Pacific. The Hawaiian and Samoan Islands had been inhabited by native Polynesian people for centuries who managed to live self-sufficient societies. But with the arrival of Americans and Europeans, that would all change. Both islands proved to be crucial midway points for ships engaged in trade between the United States and Asia. The U.S. sought to establish Navy bases in both Hawaii and Samoa in order to gain advantage in Pacific trading. In Hawaii, American settlers would also bring with them notions of establishing sugarcane plantations as well as exploitative labor practices and highly infectious diseases that would decimate the Hawaiian native population. White Americans would gradually take more and more power from the ruling Hawaiian monarchs and bring in laborers from Japan, China, Portugal, and the Philippines, among other nations, to keep the labor force diverse, divided, and docile. For years, Hawaiian sugar was exempt from United States tariffs, but when that ended in 1890, the desire to become a state grew among Americans living on the islands. Standing in their way was a staunch Hawaiian nationalist in Queen Lilio Kalani who wished to keep her nation free from imperialist hands. Ultimately, she would yield her authority as the American military would force her to relinquish power to a provisional government of white Americans. White Americans only made up 5% of Hawaii at that time. Samoa would suffer a somewhat similar fate, except Great Britain and Germany also laid claims to the island nation. After several brushes with warfare, the three nations agreed to share Samoa, but did so unsuccessfully. The United States and Germany would split Samoa and compensate Great Britain with other islands throughout the Pacific. Needless to say, the Samoans and other Pacific Islanders were not consulted in these matters. In Hawaii and Samoa, the United States kind of dips its toes in imperialism. In the war with Spain, the United States would essentially just dive right in. At the start of the 1890s, Cuba was the last remaining colony held by the once mighty Spanish Empire that had previously held almost all of Central and South America in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. But Cubans resisted Spanish rule for decades previously, and in 1895, hostilities resumed. The Cuban revolt against Spain was particularly brutal, with both sides committing horrific atrocities. But American journalists found the American public to be keenly interested in the events of this revolt and reported extensively on Spanish atrocities and somewhat ignoring atrocities committed by Cuban rebels. These journalists would come to be known as yellow journalists as they often provided very sensationalized depictions of world events in order to persuade readers' emotional sensibilities. As stories and images from Cuba flooded the American consciousness, hostility towards Spain grew and grew until the situation literally exploded. American naval ship, the USS Maine, exploded in the harbor of the Cuban capital of Havana in 1898, killing over 260 people on board. The ship was there to provide aid and to support Americans living in Cuba. An outraged American public demanded retribution and vengeance upon the nation of Spain. A hasty and inaccurate government investigation concluded that it was a Spanish attack that caused the explosion, even though later reports would indicate that it was actually caused by an accident in the engine room of the ship. President McKinley hoped to avoid war, even though many in his administration wanted badly to fight a war. He would demand Spain cease fighting, negotiate for peace, and end the practice of sending Cubans to concentration camps. Spain agreed to all of those things, except they would not negotiate with the rebels. The American public was dissatisfied with this outcome, and war was declared days later. <laughs> 
Secretary of State John Hay would describe the Spanish-American War as a splendid little war, and to be fair, it was to those who weren't actually fighting in it. The war began in April and ended in August. Only 460 Americans would die in battle, but an additional 5,200 Americans would die of diseases as the United States military proved to be ill-equipped to supply and protect soldiers in a tropical climate. Munitions were poorly supplied in terms of clothing that was too heavy and food that was often inedible. Moving soldiers to Cuba proved to be difficult as many volunteer militias and National Guard units were disorganized and inexperienced. Adding to the confusion was the fact that many African American soldiers would face discrimination during the war effort and would often resist. They also encountered a racially integrated Cuban army which would expose more African Americans to the injustices they faced back home. It was somewhat of an accident of history. The assistant secretary of the Navy at the time was a guy by the name of Theodore Roosevelt, who had a strong desire to make a name for himself and his country. His actions would dramatically shift the focus of the war from freeing Cuba from Spanish rule to essentially robbing Spain of all its colonies. Roosevelt would direct the nation's Pacific fleet to attack the Spanish colony in the Philippines and take it, which it did relatively easily in May of 1898. Americans were too busy rejoicing at the news of victory to consider that their government had essentially engaged in a hostile takeover of another imperialist nation's territory rather than the noble liberation of an oppressed people. After the capture of the Philippines, the war in Cuba continued. The war was accelerated when a Spanish fleet slipped past the U.S. Navy and settled in Santiago Harbor. The U.S. Atlantic Fleet quickly bottled the Spanish in Santiago Harbor. Then U.S. troops under the command of General Nelson A. Miles would leave Tampa and in a comedy of errors took five full days to go ashore in Cuba, even though the enemy offered no opposition. As troops advanced upon Spanish resistance in Santiago, a cavalry unit known as the Rough Riders would engross themselves in the center of a great deal of the fighting. The leader of the Rough Riders was none other than Theodore Roosevelt, who had resigned from his position as assistant secretary to join the war effort. He struggled heavily to ensure his unit saw action before war's end, and as numerous newspapers back stateside would report, he would lead a daring and perhaps reckless charge to capture Kettle Hill. Though his part was relatively minor in the overall war effort and his charge got 100 of his fellow soldiers killed or wounded, Roosevelt's heroism was celebrated throughout the country. Overwhelmed and outnumbered, the Spanish would declare an armistice and would recognize the independence of Cuba. Puerto Rico, which lies to the west of Cuba on the other side of the island of Hispaniola, would be annexed by the United States during the Spanish-American War. Americans didn't really raise much of a fuss over the annexation. Puerto Rico had been a part of the Spanish Empire since 1508 and was set to achieve a large degree of independence until the United States began to occupy it during the Spanish-American War. When the war ended, the United States would basically make the island a colony and establish a governor and a branch of legislature directly under the control of the United States. The U.S. would also have veto power over anything the Puerto Rican legislature passed. With tariffs removed, the Puerto Rican sugar industry boomed as they were now integrated with American markets. But the reliance on sugar as a cash crop went a bit too far, as now Puerto Ricans had to import much of their food as it was cheaper to do that than to grow food on the island when sugar could provide a greater profit. It's a good question, Taft. Can't really say I can answer that truthfully. Puerto Rico would live and die by the booms and busts of the global sugar market. This, along with continued encroachments of American culture upon Puerto Rican culture, would lead many to desire independence, whereas others would push for statehood. But not everybody in the United States was too keen on this new imperialistic direction the nation was taking. Though most white Americans found establishing colonies in nearby Caribbean islands to be acceptable, colonizing a densely populated country on the other side of the planet seemed a touch excessive. President McKinley would favor annexing the Philippines because he felt that returning them to Spain would be cowardly and dishonorable, allowing other European empires to take it would be bad business, and to grant the Philippines independence would be irresponsible because he racistly believed that the Filipinos were incapable 
capable of ruling themselves. Instead, he would decide to annex the Philippines and then educate, civilize, and Christianize the Filipinos living there. He would adopt sort of the same approach towards Filipinos that was taken towards Native Americans, in which Filipinos would be sort of part of the United States, but not American citizens. However, a fairly diverse group of dissenters to imperialism would emerge throughout the country. Labor leaders didn't like the idea because they worried that Filipino labor would be used to undercut American labor. Industrialists like Andrew Carnegie worried about unwanted competition brought by new territories. Some racistly worried that Filipinos would pollute the American white identity. And some just flat out felt imperialism was wrong and immoral. The political leader of this dissent would emerge in William Jennings Bryan, who would make anti-imperialism his main focus in the 1900 election, in which he was again the Democratic candidate. He would run on the idea that ratifying the annexation of the Philippines was a mistake, but just like when he ran against McKinley in 1896, he lost, and this time by an even greater margin. Things were going relatively well for the Republicans and for the majority of white American men who could vote at the time. So they stuck with the Republican ticket, which they saw as a winner. Which brings us to our last section on the Republic as Empire. Now, though the United States Empire was very small compared to its English and French counterparts, it still found itself embroiled in the same kind of tensions and conflicts in both Europe and the Far East that it had tried for decades to avoid. For many of the American colonies, the process of managing these territories was relatively smooth, as was the case in Alaska, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and Guam. After the war, Americans would help build up Cuban infrastructure as they would build roads, schools, hospitals, and help restructure the economy and government. But when Cuba tried to pass a constitution that completely left the United States out, well, we felt hurt by that. Really hurt hurt our feelings so bad that we passed the Platt Amendment, which effectively gave all control over foreign policy in Cuba to the United States. So bad that we essentially stormed the island economically, gained control over most Cuban industries, ruled over them from afar, and essentially turned the island into a giant sugar colony like Puerto Rico. Naturally, the Cubans hated this and would revolt from time to time, forcing American troops to occupy the island from 1906 to 1909 and again in 1912. The Philippines would prove to be an even bigger blood-soaked nightmare than Cuba. Filipinos had been resisting imperialism before the Americans ever arrived, and after the United States annexed the islands, the resistance only intensified. Guerrilla fighters under the leadership of Emilio Aguinaldo would wage a brutal campaign against occupying American forces. Many of the same brutal tactics used by the Spanish against the Cubans that outraged Americans would be used against Filipino guerrillas. Few prisoners would be taken, as American soldiers would often kill indiscriminately anyone even remotely suspected of being a guerrilla fighter. The lack of mercy was remarkable, as the ratio of dead to wounded among Filipino soldiers was 15 dead for every one person wounded. As a means of comparison, the Civil War saw one person dead for every five wounded. By the time the Filipino War had subsided, 4,300 Americans, nearly 10 times as many as Cuba, were killed in action. By most estimates, around 50,000 native Filipinos would also be killed. After the war ended, power was transferred over to the United States and the U.S. would appoint its first governor of the Philippines in William Howard Taft. Hey Taft, is that true? In the Philippines, the Americans would build roads, sewers, hospitals, schools, bridges, and would reform the administration and finances of the islands. Though a great deal of autonomy was given to the Philippines, the economy of the islands would be increasingly linked and dependent on the American economy. But after successive American governors, the islands would be granted independence in 1946. Meanwhile, in China, European imperialists were drooling over the prospect of dividing up the nation which had found itself in decay after a century of humiliation. Europeans eager to carve the great cake of China worried Americans who enjoyed a great deal of trade with the nation. In order to try and preserve this, Secretary of State John Hay, under the directive of President McKinley, would advocate for an open-door policy. 
Basically, what this meant was that Europeans would respect their respective territories in China, but also respect pre-existing trade agreements, in particular, those involving the United States. Basically, the U.S. didn't want to have to get involved in any military action in China, but it would also be allowed the same trade agreements it had been enjoying previously. European leaders initially hesitated on this proposal, but a rebellion would change their tune. A massive anti-imperialist uprising would emerge as a secret society of rebels would attempt to drive out all Western influence from China. Many of the rebels practiced a Chinese martial art, which Westerners just called boxing and thusly called the rebellion the Boxer Rebellion. A massive coalition of European nations, as well as the United States and Japan, would step in and end the rebellion. In return for their assistance, the United States would be granted their open-door policy. The century of Chinese humiliation would unfortunately continue. Lastly, the war with Spain exposed how backwards the United States military was at that time. In a somewhat unusual move, McKinley would appoint corporate lawyer Elihu Root as the Secretary of War who would oversee the overhaul of the military. Root would expand the fighting force of the nation from 25,000 to 100,000, he would establish schools for officer training for the Army and the Navy, and he would establish a staff of generals called the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which would act as advisors to the Secretary of War and would collaborate between branches of the military and ensure the military was run professionally. The United States would enter the 20th century as a modern global empire, complete with a more modern military, a highly industrialized and increasingly global economy, as well as massive issues at home regarding race, class, and gender. And the following century would see those issues tested like never before or since in American history. Thank you guys so much for watching, and don't forget, you gotta keep pushing, Gene. Thank you.